All right, Steve, welcome to the Man Talk Show. Thank you, Connor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, such a such a pleasure. You know, I've um, heard some wonderful things about your work. I've I've consumed some of your uh, ideas and some of the content of you know previous interviews, and I, I appreciate your perspective. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. So I'm going to start off with the question, which <laughs> I threw you a curveball in the beginning before we jumped on, uh, which is tell us a story about a defining moment in your life. Yes, it did throw me a curveball when you, you did most of give me the heads up before a few minutes before we started. I was thinking, gosh, because defining moments, you know, as, as we were saying, very often uh, very personal, aren't they? And um, you know, you're talking about my podcast and I was interviewing recently a memory expert uh, who's also, my podcast is a uh, group Viking podcast, interviews all kind of people, meditation, scholars of, of meditation and contemplative things and so on. And this memory expert has a very unusual meditation practice, which is he memorizes <clears throat> large passages of Sanskrit and recites them as his as his practice. Really fascinating. Anyway, but as we were talking with him, as I was talking with him, we talked also about memory. And he was talking about how when you tell a story, uh, it changes one's memory of it. There's a, a sort of, in the, in the requirement to reconstruct a story, it becomes something other uh, than was before. And it's somewhat redefined. I think there is a case to be made for, I know that, that there's a trend, I think, isn't there, to disclose all one's um, most profound and personal intimate moments. Um, and I think, you know, that there can be a good learning experience for others to, uh, to see that. And I, I think it can also perhaps be used more cynically to engender trust, the kind of vulnerability, um, move in a way. But, um, but I think an unintended effect is that it can, in a certain sense, when you take something that's personal, private and interior, and you put it on public display. I think it it it, can, it changes it basically. It makes it um, solidifies it in a way in the telling of it. I can do that, but anyway, yeah. So I was thinking, gosh, what what do I want to say? Well, I can. I, here's a funnier story. In my teens, I had a period, brief period of being rather uh, got caught up a little in fundamentalism Christianity. Right? It's kind of embarrassing to say, but you ask for a defining moment, so I think by nature, it's going by definition, it's going to be a bit embarrassing, and. Um, I was raised in a sort of Catholic context, but my mother didn't like the doctrine side. So we never went to the doctrinal trainings that the children go to, to be indoctrinated with, with the tenets of the religion. Uh, she had this idea of a private faith. So you go to the mass, and I was an old boy actually, and you sort of take it as a ritual, as a contemplation to connect with God yourself or peace or whatever, really quite open in that sense. So a very open, contemplative oriented uh, experience of Catholicism actually which I think was excellent. But then of course I gained, came to my teens and as teenagers often do, one's looking to individuate oneself, one's looking for, uh, you know, right and wrong and what's, what's the meaning of life and what, you know, how does the world work? And I think teenagers can be a little prone to black and white thinking because at that age we lack the nuance of life experience, don't we? So you come across a good idea, perhaps the first good idea, coherent presentation of something, and it's, it can be very compelling. The certainty, I think, the certainty at that age is very compelling. And Eric Hoffer wrote this marvelous book called True Believer. And he's talking about ideologies and religious movements and so on, and analyzing the structure of how it is that people of all uh, types and all intellects and all strata of society um, can be caught up in, in such uh, movements. It's, it's a very fascinating study. And uh, he said that the appeal of a doctrine or the effectiveness of a doctrine is not in its um, accuracy, but in its certitude, in its certitude, the degree to which it can sell or grant certainty, relief from ambiguity and um, uncertainty, I suppose. Uh, it can be very, there's something very appealing about that. And it doesn't, it really doesn't really matter that much if the doctrine is particularly accurate or well-reasoned or argued, uh, those things are less important, the more important thing. That's why we have to be trained to think critically, <laughs> because we're prone sometimes, I think, aren't we? Uh, people, I mean, uh, in general, can be prone anyway to being caught in certainty, 
uh, traps. So anyway, that's all sort of my uh, excuse, I suppose. Eventually, I sort of grew out of it, actually, did two, three years. But I was a bit intolerable for a couple of years at parties, certainly, you know. And so I was, um, <laughs> so, uh, I was walking along the street and I had this habit, which I had for, since I was quite young, actually, before all that um, fundamentalism bit, uh, business, which was often if I'd see a homeless person, um, I would give them a coffee or this sort of thing. I just had, I don't know where I got that idea from as a kid, but I would do that. And uh, I was walking along and sure enough, there was a homeless person there. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get this person a coffee or a tea or something like that. So I went into the coffee shop, came back out and I had the coffee and I gave them the coffee. And then that was it. That was the end of the exchange. But then I added another step. I said, do you know why I gave this to you? And he said, why? And then I lied to him. I said, because Jesus loves you. I said that, right? <laughs> uh, which wasn't true. That's not why I did it. Mm. But then I watched him, his face transform into a performance towards the religious do-gooder. Uh, you know, he learned, it seemed to me, it seemed to me um, that when dealing with such a person, one has to act a certain way. And he had a whole routine, uh, how you deal with someone who's religiously sort of motivated in that sense. And it was sort of horrifying to watch him dehumanize like that and have to dance to this, you know, this is a tune that he's presumed we had to dance to before. And of course, the, the, that was horrifying to, to witness that uh, that consequence of my um, deceit. But the other thing that was funny was that the deceit was really clear. I didn't give it to this homeless person because Jesus loved me and I wanted to sort of pass that on. It was actually because I loved him. I felt compassion and uh, care and human connection with him. That's why I gave it to him. And so... In discharging what I felt was my religious duty, I departed from the basic motivation of human human kindness and saw the effects. And that really stuck with me. That really stuck with me. The difference between, yes, the, the, the discerning of those different motives and the effects of uh, that kind of a, a kind of an action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautifully said. Well, thank you for for sharing that <clears throat> that moment and that period of your life and. I do think that, you know, we seem to live in, uh, and maybe this has always been the case. I'm not, I'm not sure, but we do seem to live in a period of time where vulnerability has become a sort of staple nutrient of consumption from society. You know, it's sort of like a barrier to entry. If you want to be on social media, if you want to gain acceptance and validation, if you want to gain power. Uh, in many ways, then vulnerability seems to be this this sort of like tool and resource, as you said. I think you said it, it can become cynical, right? It can be used for sort of like almost like menacing means. Um, but so, uh, you know, culture does seem to have a, a an interesting relationship with that. I'm going to shift gears because one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about is I do want to talk about the the path out of our thoughts and into the body or or at, or at the very least a uh, um, talk about some of your methods because you do a lot of somatic work and I think that there's a lot of men that will benefit from that and, and have benefited from that. But I want to first start with a broader context of how you see the state of men in our current society. And I'm going to leave the question fairly broad and vague and I'll let you do with it and take with it as, as you will. So what, what do you see as being the state of men within our current culture? And what do you think that men are being asked to do, asked to see, asked to build either within themselves or within the world around them? And yeah, well, just I'll leave, I'll leave that there. I know it's sort of a, a broad and very large question. Mm. I wonder if we might narrow it down. The, uh, I'm reluctant or hesitant to comment on men in society. Mm -hmm. as a as a general whole um actually i'm a little reluctant to do that because um my experience of men tends to be as individuals or small groups i don't tend to have much contact with 
the sort of body of general men in society, in which society, you know, in general, and I think even, you know, even in uh, the countries in which we live, of course, we live in different countries, but we, we share, I think our societies share a lot in common, of course, but even within those, uh, there's, there's subsections and layers, aren't there? There's all different kinds mm -hmm. of um, groups of men and individual men. I'm reluctant to do that. I'm, I'm skeptical of, uh, of, um, of that. However, I think there, there are valid means to talk about that statistic, statistical analysis. We could do statistical analysis of various different trends, um, polling of various kinds. And, and there are people who are better at that than me. You know, they can tell you, well, this is the divorce rate. This is the uh, su male suicide rate. This is the, these things. I think that's an interesting, I, that's an interesting way of getting, um, pointers towards what might be societal trends. But of course, sometimes statistics can be misleading. Mm -hmm. One might think that a, a univariate analysis of a certain statistic can be misleading. We think, well, this differential here between these two groups is due to their being in different groups, but it, there may be other factors at play. So uh, I think we, even statistics have to be taken within some sort of a, bro a broader analysis and a, a kind of a, they can lead the way or hint the way, but they don't tell the whole story. Is there something more specific, or maybe that's enough of an answer? Yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 good. I had a I had a feeling that that was the path that you were going to take, and I I, I appreciate that. And the, the reason why I asked the question in, in that way is because I I do think that it's important to not have a sort of broad brush stroke. So can you just say a little bit more about why you don't want to, or why you think that it's not? Uh, beneficial to sort of talk about men as a whole or women as a whole society and culturally, because I, I do think that that's happening quite a bit right now. You know, I do mm -hmm. think that, um, that there is just this sort of over generalization of men or of women within our culture. Um, I, yeah, I would just be curious before we sort of drill down into a more, uh, nuanced question, why do you feel it's important to, to not go down that path? Well, I, I said, I'm reluctant to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's necessarily always a bad idea to do that. Um, but it, I think it's probably usually a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends, you know, what, who's, who's speaking, you know, mm. is it somebody who just feels a strong conviction of an opinion, uh, based on anecdotal evidence of their own lives and, and, you know, their friends or what they're, what they've seen on YouTube or on the television, and they, they get in a sort of, they take a certain position. They get, the world seems to be this way to me, this mm -hmm. idea, the world seems to be this way. Well, the thing that seems to be happening to men is this, that, and the other. Well, maybe, but that, the problem with, I mean, of course we have to navigate the world as it seems to be to us, but we are having a bit of epistemological humility. That mm. how it seems to you is, of course, all you can really do in navigating a lot of your life. But it doesn't mean, it's not especially accurate. If one wants to make the sort of pronouncements on the scale of, say, all men, I think one needs to have a better a better basis for that. One needs to think very deeply and very seriously about that kind of a pronouncement. It can't just be based on what seems, I mean, I know people do it, mm -hmm. but I think it's not so wise to just say what, what seems to me to be the case. Um, I think it's an important subject, you know, this group of men is con, con, contains many individual people. Um, and it's not just a sort of a, 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 a sort of ideological chess piece. So these individual people have their own lives and so on. And one has to be, I think, respect speaking into people's lives like that. And those people are, those men are associated with other men and women and all kinds of, they're embedded within relationships. And so I think one has to be cautious uh, mm -hmm. before making grand pronouncements that are likely unless one's done some really deep thinking and some actual research that takes one beyond one's assumptions one's likely just to be sort of repeating what one's picked up somewhere else uh, a mouthpiece of, of of somebody else's idea that happens a lot it seems one, one imbibes it absorbs it it feels so right and then we talk it as if it's our truth but it's secondhand mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm reluctant to first of all i think the scope is so large men, society, it's so large that I, I said, I'm reluctant to do it. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying nobody should do it. I just think that I'm reluctant to do it. And of course, what's the downside? Well, if, you know, I've just listed some, I think, 
Yeah, I mean, there are many downsides uh, of, of talking at the group level. Uh, but, you know, if you cross the road, you might get hit by a car. So just because it's a downside doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means that you have to be aware of the possible pitfalls. I think that's wise, isn't it? So when it comes to some of the men that you individually see and interact with, whether it's in group or, or uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, what are what are some of the things that you see those men being confronted by in their life needing to sort of tackle the whether that's on a, a spiritual level a, a sort of unconscious mythological level uh, what do you do you see any patterns happening within the men that, that you interact with yes i think um if we limit it to that sample size yeah it seems to me men are many men that i've i've I talked to uh, there are some specifics they're dealing with the basic sort of human human needs uh, meaning what's the point relationship should i have one increasingly that actually is a question not how do i get one mm -hmm. but should i have one which is kind of interesting mm -hmm. you're nodding there perhaps that's something you've noticed and um you know justify to me why i should you know i think i want to but my analysis tells me it's not you know a good deal right or something like this some guys say that i've heard that which is interesting or now i'm in one how do i do the right thing how do i uh be a good person in this relationship and uh, how do i you know navigate that i want to understand it more so i can do it, do it better because you know for my partner I, I love my partner or whatever it is or how do i uh, about being a father it becomes very important then how do i become a good man in terms of being a father, that seems very, very important. And lots of people, um, I think, are really thinking hard about that. Um, wh wh how should I navigate the economic landscape? What sort of job should I do? You know, how should I spend my time and so on and so forth? You don't get too many guys wondering about how to find their purpose. That, 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 that only say that sort of thing if, if they've heard that somewhere else generally. It's more like, how can I do something meaningful, meaningful work? How do I find an outlet? from my energy because of course life is like pouring out you're just constantly pouring out your life every day it's sort of running out you know like the sand in the hand sort of thing so given that it's pouring out um how can i give that to something greater i think that also ties into meaning or something meaningful useful you know a lot of uh, men talk about that you know some men are worried about health of course as well money financial management, so things like that, some guys have health, you know, and so on. So I think it's all these sorts of basic sort of things. Uh, and depending on who they are and their upbringing and their cultural context uh, and various other factors, there's some variation on those themes, but it seems to be health, wealth, and relationship and family and meaning, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I want to return to the relationship component because I've, I've heard that as well. I think increasingly i've noticed a rise of men who are questioning whether or not they should be in a relationship or whether that is you know whether a relationship is for them for a, a number of reasons right i mean financial reasons and political reasons and uh legal reasons you know you said is, is it is it a good deal i think that there's a lot of <clears throat> a lot of men that have seen uh, you know, their, their fathers go through something or read stories and forums online and that kind of stuff. And it sort of embeds this question of, of should I, and, and is it worth it? And I'm curious to just sort of get your take on that. Like, do you, do you think that that's a byproduct of, well, what do you think that's a byproduct of? Like are, are more men being drawn to a, a monastic way of living or is it something to do with the changes this, this sort of like climate changes between men and women. Just light questions today, only light questions. <laughs> no, this is great. I, I think I'm very pleased to be thinking about things like this with you. Um, I've heard a lot of hypotheses about it. The, the answer is I don't know. I think there's always been something of that. There's always been something of that. That's why we have things like, you know, the monastic, you know, path or whatever, or even or even career or uh, military service and so on and so forth. You know, so um, 
but probably something it's a bit a bit like one uh, here's a positive way of saying it okay i mean i know i could we, we could list all the usual analysis uh, about it but maybe a positive way of saying it is as choice and gender roles you could say open up for better or worse you lose something you know you you lose the template you lose the auto, you know the sort of this is what a good man is kind of thing you lose that um because some of those th things become not just the province of of men right so anyway but what you gain is choice so i think with more choice comes more a burden i think of uh, there's a burden that comes with choice is it they say freedom isn't it spider-man <laughs> freedom comes responsibility so you <laughs> know great uh yeah with great response yeah with great power comes great responsibility right okay well then freedom i think uh one you know if you can do if you if if there's more options theoretically anyway available to you which is a you know this is a very positive spin um but i think what 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 may as well make uh, lemonade out of lemons you know so if there's if one has a positive i mean we can think very depressed about it oh i don't know what to do with my life well that's yeah but the positive of that you could say is that there's quite a bit of freedom there but it's very hard to navigate and to figure out what to do next um that's especially as, as you're young growing up and so on because you don't know mm. very much you i think this might be a good idea i'd like to be an astronaut you know i'd like to be a superhero <laughs> i'd like to be a spy you know whatever you know you don't you don't really know what you're doing i wanted to be so many things growing up i wanted to have my own karate school you know at one point and i wanted to be a priest for a hot minute which i think you know all altar boys think about that i mean i not i didn't know what a priest did i just liked you know the walking around with a candle and you know i wanted to do all so many, so many different things so uh but you know that's what kids do so perhaps it's something to do with that you know there's a choice there that you can you know i mean that's that's a bit of a dodge of an answer i must say uh, I, I don't know if we want to get I mean, I the weeds that, you know what do you think no no i mean i don't think we need to get super into the weeds but i do think it's an interesting experience that a lot of men are having you know as as relationships begin more and more online in the digital realm you know something like 42 percent of relationships start online now and i think as as that migration happens there seems to be a, a technological shift where a lot of these dating apps are constructed in a way to give women the primary choice and i think what has been interesting is that you see you see some of the selection metrics coming out of these platforms like Tinder or Hinge or you know whatever the whatever the platform is and you have you have something like you know I think it's the majority of women are are choosing 10% of the men and then you have men choosing 50 to 60% of the women and so you you see this sort of like selection dynamics starting to show up within the data within how people are choosing one another online and i think it's it's becoming i think a lot of men are becoming maybe frustrated that might be a generalization but i think a lot of men who aren't in what would be classified as maybe an, an upper uh echelon like the top sort of five percent of what you know women deem men to be as valuable um i think a lot of men that are do you sort of like average everyday guys are starting to see that maybe it's not worth as much of the effort to put into having the perfect dating profile photo and the perfect bio and and all of those types of things and instead to just go and and uh and go and live their life so i see a lot of men sort of shifting away from trying to really go and date as much as humanly possible and into developing themselves right into the questions that you were sort of proposing before, like, how do I make meaning in my life? You know, there's, it's almost like a lot of men are feeling into uh, a sort of void of meaning in their life. And they're moving in search of that question versus in search of a partner. And so I, I don't, again, I don't know if that's 100% true or not. But that's just my observation is that there's this sort of pull towards I want to find meaning in my life and maybe a partnership will happen after I find a deeper quality of meaning in my life. So 
Yeah, well, I mean, I'll I'll let you just comment on that, and then we'll we'll move on past this because I want to get into your your work and your teachings. Yeah, I expect that's got something to do with it, perhaps. You know, of course, it can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it can be very nihilistic, I think, and and dark. If you really want to know, of course, you know, I'm sure, Connor. But if you really want to know why, what what's behind these ideas, the MGTOW movement, men going their own way movement, elaborates a lot of ideas. Now, whether or not the ideas are true isn't the point. The point is that they're strongly held convictions that are, mm. um, you know, resonate with certain people. Yeah, and perhaps for some, they're on the wrong end of that distributional curve. But also, you know, uh, a, a lot of the relationship itself, I think, is up for grabs, up for discussion. What is the point of a relationship? Mm. This is generally, and I'm talking about men necessarily, anybody in relationship with anybody. What, uh, romantic, I mean. Is it for family? Well, maybe. But one of the things I emphasize with people when we're talking about relationships and uh, we're discussing it, I ask them, what's their why? Why are they in relationships? Turns out a lot of people don't ask that question. Do you want to have a family? Well, you better make sure your partner wants to do that too. Do you, do you want to you know, travel the world? Do you want to have a, a relationship in which you can grow? Right? In which you can grow, which of course, a very difficult relationship a lot of the time because growth can sometimes be difficult and painful. So if you want to orient to that, just make sure you really want that. <laughs> you know, what do you want? Do you want somebody who can, uh, you know, uh, indulge your hobbies with and, um, you know, live a certain kind of lifestyle with and so on? You know, what is it that you want relationship for? Because the usual templates of relationship, they st they're still available, but there's much more diversity now than there used to be. So you do actually, I think, have to define that. And when you say about online dating, Another interesting thing about online dating is that you meet people who are sort of geographically rela uh, uh, related to you, but that might be about the only other thing, and you're both using the app, that you have in common. So you're not meeting these people in the course of your day-to-day -day lives, carrying out your normal interests and occupations. So whilst it does give you an abundance of, of choice, in, in a certain sense, compatibility uh, needs to be, I think, emphasized. You, know, you, can't, you can't just, whoever will have you. Whoever will have you. <laughs> mm. Oh, great. I think that worked probably in, I don't know, throughout a lot of human history. <laughs> the door's unlocked, you walk through do, it, you know. But I don't right, know if that's right. a, I do that's think a great that, strategy. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think you've you've talked about choice a few times, and I do think that there is a sort of paradoxical nature to having more choice leading to at least I think within us as men, I, maybe I'll just speak from my own individual experience, which is that the more choice that I have, the harder it seems to be to choose. And the more in my logical, rational brain, I can be prone to becoming, you know, I, I can find myself if it's like walking into a restaurant where there's five items on the menu, or walking into a cheesecake cafe where there's an almanac, you know, of thousands of choices of what you can choose from and if you're not intentional of going into that space already knowing what it is that you want uh which i think you know this it's kind of a terrible analogy right a, a restaurant and a menu versus versus dating but we'll, we'll stick with it nonetheless uh if you're not intentional of, of knowing what you want then you can be met with a tremendous amount of confusion of what to actually choose, of what's right for us as individuals. Uh, so I, I think I see, again, I'm, I'm sort of speaking for some of the men that I have worked with, and I'm speaking for myself when I was single, I'm married now and, and have a child, but um, I, I know that that was a, that was a challenge because there was, there was so many options. And mm -hmm. there, were, uh, there were long periods of time in my life where I actually didn't know what I wanted, right? I didn't know uh, the quality of relationship that I wanted or the type of woman that I wanted to be with. And so it was just sort of like a, a sample selection, you know, going through the menu and, and trying a whole bunch of different types. And so um, hmm. any any thoughts, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, a, a great virtue is being able to make do with what little you have. There's a great virtue hmm. there, isn't there? Uh, but I think one also has to learn how to navigate abundance. It feels less <laughs> virtuous. <laughs> <laughs> because it's almost an abundance, an embarrassment of riches. There is such a phrase, an embarrassment of riches, right? And right. Uh, but nonetheless, um, one has to learn to say perhaps no more than once says yes, and how to navigate that. And I think there are, there are a few ways to do it. And one of the ways, yeah, is to, um, is to is to you know look look around for people who you admire, 
um, and look around uh, for inspiration also from the past, from the great thinkers of the past, the great uh, figures of the past and their writings. I think that's very important. Don't read a men's coach book. Um, I mean, okay, do, you know, but read uh, s some great thinkers of the past who've wrestled with similar things. I mean, these, you know, we might think it's particularly new. The dynamics are not that new. These dynamics have been going on throughout history. I know, for instance, Stoicism has b become very popular lately or is becoming increasingly popular um, as a sort of less nihilistic version of, you know, <laughs> of some of these sort of um, uh, philosophies we've been talking about or referring to. Uh, some of these writers uh, faced great difficulty and challenge in their life, had a lot of responsibility and uh, dealing with very difficult people and difficult and a lot of, uh, you know, people under their rule and so on and whatever. Uh, very smart people too. And these texts very often have survived many hundreds of years. There's something there to be gained, I think, to go back, counsel, the council of the elders, so to say, rather than in, an intermediate, uh, taking it through the intermediary of, say, a men's coach, which I'm very suspicious of such a person um, mm. or skeptical of such a person. Um, just because anyone can do it, you know, it's 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 like uh, it's like well, now we're talking once again about abundance of riches. So another uh, that's one thing. Another thing I think is to notice how one feels after consumption uh, of of I'm thinking of food. which you're know, using the menu, right? So you go into the restaurant, mm -hmm. you don't know what to buy, so you buy this, this, and this, and then how how do you know if you like it or not? Well, maybe afterwards you can tell. How do you feel afterwards? So I think that's very often the case. After afterwards, after say a date, we're talking about dating or you know your your rest your restaurant analogy. How do you feel? Or after you've uh, you know spent some time with somebody, how do you feel after you've made love with somebody? How do you feel? Very often we blank off that part, cut off that part, on to the next thing, on to the next thing, and especially if it doesn't feel good, on to the next thing because the next thing occupies the attention, so you don't have to feel what doesn't feel good. So I think. Um, this is why meditation is can be quite useful, uh, because uh, life is so full of things and interesting things to do that if we don't actively stop, uh, then there's not many natural ways of stopping. Life doesn't present us with many natural stopping points. So the meditation, you know, perhaps often the purview of people attempting to get enlightened, but actually, but it can also be just an, an actual stopping time to catch up to see uh, if there's something that needs to come out or some processing. So I think. Um, Noticing, how do you feel afterwards? Do you feel drained? Do you feel replenished? Do you feel afraid? Do you feel um, avarice? Do you feel greed you know, or, or uh, neediness or whatever? Navigate those things because the, a lot of times those uh, responses are driving the next action, the next behavior, even if we don't feel them. So I think that's another way of, of in, when one is presented with an embarrassment of riches, in navigating uh, through, is to, like I say, you know, refer to the great thinkers and, and, and writers of the past and see how you feel after you do things. You know, that, that's a, those, are, those are pretty good. Um, those are pretty good ways. And see how little you can get away with. What I mean by that is see how little, as an experiment, this is uh, something actually one sees in Stoicism. I, I'm, just, I'm not a Stoic myself. I just, just comes to my mind at this point. It's Aurelius or he talks about um, spending time and I can't remember now exactly the details, but you know, putting on sackcloth and ashes and imagining everything's gone and you've lost everything, you know, sort of coming back to zero, starting at zero. That's a good thing to do. Sometimes I do that when I was sitting on my boat here. I live on a boat and I have books here and you know, coffee and it's just so nice. So sometimes I sit here, because I do meditate, and I, sometimes I sit here and I imagine myself dead. <laughs> and I imagine people coming on and distributing my books, my precious books you know, everywhere, moving them from their proper place. But, you know, and I imagine the boat, you know, being used by somebody else, lived in by somebody else, or maybe even scrapped eventually, presumably, and uh, try to imagine this sort of thing uh, to sort of reorient a little bit, come back to uh, myself. Uh, often so dispersed, I find myself anyway, among my activities and my belongings and my relationships. So sometimes it's nice to come back to oneself and recognize mm -hmm. that when one dies, the world will continue. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's not that the stakes are not, you know, you're not holding a whole, whole world, world up like Atlas. I, I mean, I, it's interesting as, as you were talking about this meditation practice, I got a, a memory of when I moved out to, to New York, um, 
I was living in Vancouver and I had an apartment out there and I had all this stuff, right? Books. And I mean, I guess I didn't have a lot. I had, I had books and I had some audio equipment because I, I really like uh, audio. My background is in music. I have a degree in music. And, and so I had sort of like a whole setup with the record player and the, the whole thing. And those were sort of my prized possessions in my apartment, right? Was my music set up and my books. And, uh, and when, I, when I decided to move, I decided to just leave everything behind. And you know, I had a bicycle, I had my audio equipment. And, and so I gifted, a, I gifted a bunch of it to, to friends. I let go of it and, and gave it to, to um, a, local ch- a local charity. And then the apartment I actually let go of to a friend. And I said, Whatever, whatever's in this apartment that you want, you, you can just take. And, and just let it all go and just walked away from the whole thing. And it was such an interesting experiment in releasing attachment to the things that I had accumulated. Mm. And it, it, it was an interesting kind of experiment because in some ways there was a freedom and a liberation that was in that moment, but there was also a grief. I found myself in moments, even since then, you know, thinking about a specific book that I want to go read again and go reference. And it's like, oh no, I gave mm. that away. Mm. <laughs> and it's, it's such a unique, uh, it, it's so interesting speaking of relationships to just see the relationships that we can develop even with, uh, objects like a book, you know, or information like these, these, these keepers. And so I guess that brings me back to the thinkers and the writers of the past and who, you have really immersed yourself in, you know, who has sort of captured your attention and who do you find yourself returning to and, and the thoughts that you find yourself returning to that you really appreciate? Mm. Well, that, that's a very interesting question. Perhaps I could comment a little on uh, love and Please. loss, grief. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, those two things go hand in hand. There's this interesting book um, uh, called Grief and Praise by Martin Prechtel. I'm not sure if you've ever read that. Interesting book. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's called Grief and Praise, or at least there's he's he's done some talks on Grief and Praise. Anyway, I think it's called that. But anyway, he he sort of makes the point, and he's not the only one to make the point, but that uh, you know, love and loss come together. Um, you can't really feel the loss of something that you don't, on some degree, love or have some kind of connection with, um, for whatever or you don't value to some extent. So I think perhaps to the degree to which one can reconcile loss or, or or be sensitized to its inevitability. I think that enlivens the enjoyment of whatever it is that one actually has at that moment. Because very often, if we're attempting to keep something, we're no longer really relating to that thing. We're, we're, not, we're, we're sort of in the future with it, attempting to keep it, worrying, um, planning, and you know there is an aspect of that I think that needs to be done. Planning. I'm not suggesting we should all live in the in the moment in in a kind of uh, sort of strange way, but in 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 the, in the sense of love and enjoyment to feel the grief. I think if one really really deeply loves one, one can't help but feel loss at the same time. When I've mostly deeply loved, I found that to be the case. There's something very poignant about the uh, transience of the relationship or the person or the circumstance or just the moment, you know, some moments are just so beautiful, but they're part, they're beautiful partly because of their, of their transience. As a musician, you know, I expect it's like the improvisation, you know, there's something about the gig, right? It has a certain quality that the recording doesn't, although the recording has qualities that the gig doesn't. And, uh, there's something, uh, about that. Like the Japanese have this idea of Sakura, right? The cherry blossoms. This, the, the, I think this is a sort of perennial theme, isn't it? Um, and of course, life and death. When one ponders one's death, you might think, oh, it's good. It would be very depressing. And for some, it is actually. It can be depressing and very produce a lot of, a lot of anxiety. But it can also have an, a, an odd effect, which is a sort of polarizes a vivacity or a enjoyment of life. Somehow, proximity to death po- polarizes life somehow. It's very interesting. And what holds back living fully sometimes is a reluctance to feel death. Because one's always tempted to protect oneself from what? From what this person thinks or this or that or the other. But if you go further, 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 and you realize that actually you can't protect yourself at the end of the day, fundamentally, none of us gets out of here in one piece. We're all going to show up at death, probably injured to some degree, bashed emotionally, physically, psychically, whatever. Um, and eventually we'll die. 
Oh, okay, okay. I can't ultimately protect myself. Maybe self-protection is uh, not the highest uh, value. Of course, it's got to be in there. Otherwise, you become a martyr. But it's not the highest value. Give, given that, you're guaranteed to fail at it. <laughs> you know. So then he says, oh, "Okay, okay, okay." You get a little less precious, perhaps. I think. I think I've noticed that with myself actually. Sometimes thinking about death, and realizing that whatever it is I'm attempting to guard against and so on is um, fundamentally that self-protection is based on um, an illusion of continuity fundamentally that self-protection now of course each instance is not uh you know it has, it's, it's its own case but the fundamental root protecting me protecting me against whatever uh, enforcing the separation between me and the outside enforcing that duality we now we, we could say it also spiritually i think you know in the, in the sort of esoteric sense or contemplative sense that constant mm -hmm. self-contraction <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's very amazing. It's, 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 I mean, it's wonderfully said. And I, I mean, immediately my mind and intuition wanted to pull the conversation into the, the question of somatic practices because it would seem as though it's almost easier. And maybe I'm wrong about this, but this is, yeah, I'm curious to get your thoughts. It's almost easier to avoid the realities of death in some capacity if we are caught only in our thoughts and not in the experience of our body, which almost has an innate sense of its of its finality, you know, that it's not limitless, that it's not infinite. And we can, I think, we at least through my own meditations and readings and, and whatnot, is that it's almost like a, an escape route, you know, to get caught in the ego, to get caught in the thoughts and to rationalize um, is almost a way to distract ourselves from the realities of, of death. And so I'm curious to get your thoughts. You know, you, you do a lot of work around getting out of the thoughts and into the body and are there practices, you know, first off, do you, do you have anything to add to what I said? But then secondly, are, are there practices that men can undertake to help move them out of the mind and into the body and to help them come into a, a deeper um, form of contact or, or communion with death? Hmm. Well, I don't know if I want to help them come into a deeper contact with death necessarily yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that, but i know what you mean of course i'm just being silly yeah yeah well um actually it seems that there are many routes to the sorts of things we're talking about and the mind is one of them philosophy uh, many philosophers have uh, great thinkers who have lived you know primarily in their let's say their thoughts or or through their thoughts have thought their way into or inquired their way into the same sort of territory we're talking about now, hmm. whatever it is we're talking about. Some kind of contemplative territory we're in, I think, maybe. Philosophy, religion, spirituality, contemplation. We're in that kind of, you know, meaning, myth, as you mentioned, myth and meaning. This kind of liminal space, right? Um, and seeing through some of the usual preoccupations and, and illusions. I think people can do that intellectually, philosophically, and there are traditions of that. And yeah, also it can be done through the body. It can be done, I think, through through many through many different ways. Um, yeah, I don't know if I try to get people out of the thoughts into the body. I think it's good to be able to be in your thoughts. It's good to be able to be in your body. The body can also be an anesthesia, a bit of a numbing. So yeah. one can become so sort of bodily focused in a sense, so anti-intellectual. I think it's uh, can be a little regressive, but it can also be an escape. See, everything can be something bad, right? That's mm -hmm. the thing. If you cross the road, you might get hit by a car. It doesn't mean you shouldn't cross the road. Like we said that when we are talking about making pronouncements about all men, right? Probably not a great idea to do that willy-nilly, at least not in public, maybe in the pub, you know. But uh, it doesn't mean that it's, it can't be done intelligently in some way. Getting stuck in the head is another matter. So one has to live in the head sometimes. If you're doing intellectual work, difficult, you know, things that require that. So you really go to the head for that. And the body is just sort of there to pump oxygen you know, to the brain and, and maybe type the keys. I think that's okay. 
but how, but people can get stuck there, right? They get stuck mm-hmm. there because it has a momentum. That momentum and also stress, right, can accumulate, etc. So, more relevant question for me when it comes to the, the head versus body thing is an easy transition between them. How do we get from the head to the body? You know, how do when we're stuck in our head and we want to disconnect from that and reconnect with the body for all kinds of reasons, you know, for intimate connection, like you mentioned, or for just enjoyment or for relaxation, de-stressing, etc. Plus, the body has good things to tell us. I like to think of it coming to the board of advisors. How do we bring the body to the board of advisors, like King Arthur's Round Table? Can we bring the body's signals and feelings and intuitions and uh, etc. to the board of advisors, along with the intellect, along with the cultural conditioning, along with the education and the analysis and everything else that makes up. So it's become sort of part of the um, round table, but not the dictator. People can go through a phase of that. The body leaps onto the center and, and one can live under a dictatorship of the body for a period of time. Uh, I don't get out of bed without my green juice and that kind of thing. You know, one that we often we have to override the body. I don't feel like getting up today. My body would like to sleep. You know, well, we're going to override that. Or if you, you know, you said you have a child, you have to get up. From what I understand, I don't have children, but I was one once, so I have some reference. But from what I hear, you have to get up in the night and do all kind of things that your body doesn't feel like doing. You're tired. You know, your body would like some more sleep, but you get up. You override the body to to, to tend to your child or meet that deadline. Or do this, that, and the other. I think it's good to do that, um, but ideal that one can feel what one's overriding, so that you don't burn out or you know if the body is withering, then eventually the mind, the brain withers too. You know, if you're overstressed, so tired, so depleted, eventually even that brilliant intellect will begin to blunt. So that cohesiveness, I think, is is um, beneficial or an ability to, to go between two. Some people are more focused in one or the other. I think that's fine. But can we get out of the body? And how, best way to do it, I think, is movement. Going for a nice walk, taking a shower and just feeling the contact the, the hands have with the body. Yeah, do yoga. I have Movement Coin Method, right? We, you, you've probably seen that in your research. I have these uh, DVD downloads about different ways of moving, joint nourishing movement, body-based mindfulness stuff. It's really great for that. My teaching partner, Michaela, has this whole modality, nonlinear movement method, which is really, really great for uh, promoting embodiment. Embodiment, I define as feeling the sensations of the body, just that, feeling what's there to be felt. Uh, you know, Tai Chi, running, you know, exercise, whatever. I think movement seems to be the quickest way to de-stress. Uh, so if one can insert that when one wants to transition from the heavy intellectual work to a more relaxed state or, or you know, wants just to get out of that or de-stress to some extent, it seems inserting some degree of mindful movement. It doesn't always have to be physical, rigorous exercise. It can be also be, as Paul Czech would say, working in, right? I like that phrase. I heard that. Or as opposed to working out, right? All these sorts of things are really good strategies. You mentioned meditation. can also be a good strategy. Um, but once again, it can also be a way of escaping, etc. But, you know, like we said, so can everything, you know. But uh, all these sorts of things that stop, reconnect with the body. But movement seems to be a real, really good hack, you know, mm-hmm. really good hack. And you can do it in two ways. If you have a regular movement practice, and that could include regular walking, it doesn't have to be some modality. Uh, but if you do a regular movement in your life, then that transition is already lubricated. It's it's not so difficult. You can That's if you want maintenance. You can also do remedial movement work where you think, gosh, I'm so stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I need to do some work now to deal with this acute situation. There's that's that. And then there's also explorative stuff. Mm-hmm. You're not trying to get from the head. You're using those modalities to explore or deepen your resources or investigate different themes and so on. So that's, I know our time is... Uh, 60 seconds left. So that's why I'm landing the plane at this point. But there, that's a quick um, zip file of some musings on the body. Good. Wonderful. Yeah, I appreciate you orchestrating uh, all, all of that in a condensed manner so that we can that we can end on time. Um, well, listen, I would absolutely love to have you back on the show and maybe talk about meditation and, and consciousness and explore that at some point, because I, I feel like the, uh, you know, the, the audience and the listeners would really appreciate your insight on those things. And so, um, yeah, so thank you very much for being here today. We'll have links in the show notes to your website, but it just, you know, coming from you, where is the best place for people to follow along if your work and your journey? Uh, guruviking.com. 
www.guruviking.com is my site. Yeah. But thank Perfect. you, Connor. It's been a real pleasure and I've, I've enjoyed talking with you very much. Likewise. Likewise. Well, for everyone that's out there, don't forget to share this episode with somebody that you know will appreciate it. And until next week, this is Connor Beaton signing off.